Hi, my name is Mike Dillard, and this is a Self Made Man, the podcast for those who want to leave their mark on the world and create a legacy of honor, integrity, and achievement in every aspect of your life. I'm glad you're here, and once again, it is time to forge your destiny. All right, guys, so I've got two huge pieces of news for you today, and the first is that the pre launch contest for the new selfmademan.com is officially live. One lucky winner is going to walk away with a brand new home office, complete with the exact same desk that I have, a loaded MacBook Pro, a new 27-inch monitor, an iPhone 10, a Yeti Pro mic, and $15,000 in cash. If you want to be that person who wins, head over to selfmademan.com right now, where you can enter the contest for free and get a sneak peek of the platform. Now, we have also added a referral system to the contest. So once you register, you'll get a referral link that you can use to help us spread the word, and you'll get five more chances to win the grand prize for every friend who signs up. Now, the winners are going to be chosen on February 20th, so hurry up and give your referral link a chance to spread and produce a bunch of extra entries for you. Now, with that being said, the second piece of awesome news today is obviously our guest, my friend and the founder of Onnit. Aubrey Marcus. You know, I don't consider many people in this world to be a mentor, but Aubrey is one that I do. As you'll hear today, he has mastered the art of building a life, a business, and a world around him that matches the vision in his mind better than anybody else I have ever met. He has spent years overcoming his biggest demons and challenges in business, in his relationships, and in his physical and mental health, and has literally transformed every aspect of his life to become the man that he's always wanted to be. Now, the methodology that he's used to accomplish all of this is what I love the most and what we're going to talk about today. The good news is that radically transforming your life does not have to be this monumental event that requires you to muster up heroic levels of discipline that many of us, myself included, have a lot of difficulty with. I think by now we all know that the chances of that working and sticking over the long run are incredibly low. But what you can do is break down that process into tiny little pieces that are much easier to implement on a daily basis. So this is what we're going to talk about today, and it's an absolute game changer. So please help me welcome Aubrey Marcus. Well, Aubrey Marcus, welcome back to the show, brother. Thank you, brother. Good yeah. to be here. Yeah, absolutely. We're sitting here in, uh, in your office and on it, so it's uh, awesome to be in the same town and, and get to come out and say hi to the team and see everybody again. Yeah, that works well. Yeah. Yeah. Miss seeing you in the gym. <laughs> I'm calling you out right we're, here. First 10 seconds of the gonna, podcast. We're going to be talking about that, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> so we're here today because I really you know, observed you and watched you write your master class essentially on, on personal productivity and, and human optimization and, uh, and your daily habits. And I remember a couple of months ago, you went off to the woods for like weeks, right, to yeah. finish this thing. So it's out, own the day, own your life. I've already started to dive into it and I'm like, oh, finally, I really need this book personally mm -hmm. because it takes a different approach to hitting your goals, right? Whatever they may, may be from a business perspective, a health perspective, a personal productivity perspective. And the freaking thing is almost 400 pages. Mm -hmm. Like you freaking crushed it. It's ambitious. Yeah, yeah. I didn't really, I had no idea what I was getting into. You know, when I, when I said yes to the book, yeah. if I would have known what it was going to take, I would have said hell no and ran the other way as fast as I could. Yeah. Well, how does, right. it, how does it feel now? To have it done? Um, it's, it's one of the things I'm probably most proud yeah. of in my life. You cool. know, I think it's, uh, even with a company like on it, you know, it's an accumulation of so much work and so many people's efforts. And it's so broad that you can always, you know, it'll never have an end date. It'll never quite be fully satisfactory, you know, but with this book, I got a chance to rewrite it seven times and really finalize it. Mm. And sure. You know, there's new things that could add. There's studies that'll come out a new study on eggs that I was like, Oh man, I wish I had that study on eggs when I was talking about how cholesterol is not the enemy back when I was writing this six months ago, but so there'll always be new things that come out. But as far as producing the absolute best that I'm capable of and encapsulating it and closing the container. Yeah. This is the thing. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. It's awesome. So I wanted to start by taking a few minutes to encapsulate the concept of owning the day, right? So let's summarize that for folks. And then I want to dive into the Aubrey before this process years ago mm -hmm. 
and the evolution that you've gone through to get here today. Sure. So owning the day, you know, I think one of the things that I've been frustrated with there are these 30 day, 40 day, 60 day, 90 day to astronaut kind of programs that kind of take you through this long path, generally narrowly focused on one nutritional change, one productivity change, one journaling change, one, one thing that's carried out over a long time. And that can be effective. But what I really wanted to say is everything in a single day is interconnected. Like what you do first thing in the morning determines what you're going to do on your way to work, determines how productive you are, determines whether you need a nap, determines whether you go to the gym, determines whether you have sex, determines whether you get a good night's sleep that night and you're able to connect with your family. And so the day is kind of the single indivisible unit in which everything is connected. So before we start talking about transformational programs, extending 40 days that are looking to modulate one little thing, let's try to just get one day exactly right. Let's try to get all of the pieces together in one day and then see how your life changes after that. Yeah. I think one of the ways you, you wrote about it in the book that I thought was, you know, really great was if you want to experience a transformation personally on a macro level, all you have to do is take care of the micro level. Yeah. Right. So again, like you just mentioned, if you want to lose 15 pounds in a month, great. You don't have to worry about the month. You just have to worry about tomorrow. Worry about today or worry about the very next meal choice. Right. (laughs) You know, like that very next thing that you're going to do when you're looking at those breakfast options and it's pancakes or the eggs with avocado and, you know, grilled spinach or sauteed spinach, like that's the choice. And that choice will determine how your blood sugar reacts, you know, and that blood sugar reaction will determine whether you get sleepy and whether you need more coffee or you want to re up more sugar. And then whether you're worn out by the time you end work and you decide, should I go to the gym or not? Like everything accumulates. So that very first step on the process is so important. So waking up and starting it right and going all the way through. That's, that's the crucial thing. Awesome. So you have not always been, uh, you know, this, this physically fit, athletic, successful company founder person that you are today. There's uh, some years that you talked about in the book, you know, back in your late twenties, specifically around the age of 30, where you were not who you wanted to be. And so can you take us back to those days? Yeah. You know, I think I was certainly not happy and I was certainly not nearly living my purpose, nearly satisfied with my life and anything. I did always somewhat retreat to fitness because that was something that I could control. So that was like when everything else was chaos, I would go work out. So, you know, I don't have a big, you know, kind of transformational story on the fitness side, but as far as my anxiety, my depression, my feeling like I'm giving my gift to the world, like I'm actually doing what I'm here to do. All of that was a total fucking mess. You know, I felt like I was a failure up until I was, you know, 31 and started on it. You know, I think everything was like, I have all this potential, but I'm not actualizing it. I'm not putting it all together. And I wasn't focused on any kind of process. I was just wanting results immediately and frustrated that I wasn't getting it. And I didn't have the the type of vision that I wish I had. You know, that started to transition heading into my 30s. And I talk about some of those transitions where even in the job that I hated and couldn't stand and was making me miserable, making a simple mental transition to understanding that this was me just buying the time and honing the skills necessary to eventually create something like on it. You know, it was just me. It's like being in prison and just writing and doing push ups and having your, you know, homie in the cell use a towel so that you can do curls so you mm-hmm. stay fit. You know, it's just like doing the best you can in a miserable situation, like knowing one day you're going to get out. And that totally shifted a lot of my happiness and anxiety and a lot of things around that. Yeah. I, you know, the interesting part is all of that misery and discomfort is totally necessary to right? push you to make, but you change, don't see that. Right? You don't see that at the yeah. time, yeah. you know, at the time it, you just lost in it. You just wallow in it. Yeah. I remember I was 26, 27 pursuing my entrepreneurial dreams post college. You know, everybody, all of my friends are in their jobs, driving their BMWs at that point, right? Their first real job, real car, real house. And I, for, you know, went all of that and waited tables at PF Chang's and having to wait tables on them during Christmas when they came in living with my folks was miserable. But when, you're, was, when you're stirring up the sauce, yeah. the secret PF oh, Chang fuck. sauce. Oh my God. <laughs> I totally blocked that out. Thank you. <laughs> uh, for them specifically, like the shot to the ego. But the bottom line is that I strategically chose to do that 
to make myself so uncomfortable that I had to get out of it. Yeah. Uh, so you need that. But at the same time, you need a plan. You need to be able to execute and, and essentially what the book is about, right? Like how do you own every single day? And I, I, I'm kind of proud of myself this morning. I, I did okay. Mm. I, ate a, I ate a good breakfast. I had eggs and, eggs and uh, black beans. Failed a little bit when I added queso to it, but. <laughs> Not as bad as you think of all the choices. Yeah. You know, like yeah. when I talk about breakfast, you know, one of the main things you want to avoid is you want to avoid the heavy carbohydrates, either sugar or the starchy stuff, because that's going to start getting your blood sugar in a swing. Now, yeah. queso probably isn't the best stuff for you. I don't even know what's in that orange cheese, but I think it's yellow number six, which <laughs> contributes to hyperactivity, contributes yeah. to a lot of things that you don't want, but at least on the macronutrient side, your blood sugar is not going to be wild. So you're not exhausted right now. You know, you're able to have at least the kind of cognitive function that you're looking for to be able to host a podcast and do that. You know, you might have to deal with some little toxic preservatives and a few other anti-nutrients, which I talk about in there too, but could be worse is what I'm saying, man. Yeah, no, well, that's, but that's the entire point. It's, it, it comes down. You're only as good as the, the last decision you made, right? Mm-hmm. So that's how you headed down the path of personal development. When did you take it, start to take it to this level of study and research and execution? Because this isn't, again, this is not a, a 75 page personal development inspirational book. Like this is definitely a manual for. Yeah, it's over a hundred thousand words. We have 397 references, over 300 clinical trials referenced in it. Yeah. This is the accumulation of not only the best of my knowledge, but all of the top people that I was able to access and work with. You know, I had, uh, a lot of meetings with Ben Greenfield, who's an expert in the field. I, you know, borrowed information from Rhonda Patrick and Mark Sisson and the, the leaders in the field and industry, all the athletes, you know, that you'll hear stories about them, things that I've learned from them along the way. And then just going directly to the, to the science and the, and the references, you know, that's something that we've been, you know, we're really known for it on in anyways is the clinical trials and the, and the evidence backing the products that we sell. And, um, it's the same with a book like this, you know, you really want to refer to the direct evidence. And this was kind of my own masterclass in that, because, mm. you know, as you actually get down to building these scientific cases for your arguments, you can't just flippantly give your opinion. You got to say, here's my opinion. And here's why this is an opinion that's credible that you need to, you know, really pay attention to. This has been shown in this many cases with this many subjects tested against placebo. This is why I'm expressing this idea and this is why it's going to work. Right. So you're one of the best people that I've come across in my life that has acquired the ability to take the vision in your head and turn it into reality. And, you know, we're freaking sitting in it right now in the form of your Mm -hmm. office and, and the honor headquarters and the gym and, even to your relationship too, right? Like you've been able to create exactly what you wanted in a very unorthodox way that most people, you know, they'd have to try to just understand it, but you've managed to pull it off and build mm-hmm. something amazing, right? So can you walk us through your mental process? Is there a conscious approach that you've taken to doing that or does it just come naturally to you? I think what I always tell people is the work starts inside. Mm-hmm. I think when you look at what you want to build, people start trying to figure out, okay, where are the Lego blocks? Where's the funding? Where's the scaffolding? Where's the people who I can hire to get this done? Where's all of that? And to me, that's all secondary. The primary thing is, are you the type of person that's in accord with what you're trying to build? If you want to build a company and be the big CEO, are you that CEO already? Are you the type of leader that can withstand the trials and tribulations? Are you the type of person that's not afraid of success, not afraid of failure? Are the type of person that has the perseverance in the tough times? Like, are you ready to be that person who could actually be in the role that you're trying? Because if you're not that person already, you know, there'll be a way and somehow, some way, even when you have all the perfect pieces together, if you're not the right person, the whole thing will collapse. So find a way to sabotage. Exactly. Exactly. Or it just won't fit for some reason it won't fit. And that's you getting the opportunity to learn the lesson and then become that person. So I really encourage everybody to just do the internal work. Like if you want to build something great, you know, be the person that builds something great, even if you haven't built it yet. Can we unpack that a little bit? Let's Let's talk about someone who's like, okay, I'm in, what do I do? 
the mind is the biggest beast that we have to deal with. It's our biggest ally and it's our biggest adversary. We have to have techniques to be able to master the mind. We have to deal with fear, you know, that capital F fear that manifests in so many forms, manifests as excessive stress that'll burn you out, manifests as quick temper, emotional response. Ego is a really fear-based, you know, organism, this desire to be recognized as something, you know, like really... I liken it to like a a really good fighter and an amateur fighter, like an amateur fighter often wants to be recognized as tough. Mm. A world champion is like, I'm fucking tough to my toenails. Like you can, you can call me a pussy and I'm going to, I'm just going to smile because it doesn't, because I know who I am, you know? So it's the difference between, you know, really kind of faking it and really being it. And I think a lot of that is doing the work, going through the practices and really finding the ways to master the mind. I mean, the fighter knows he's tough, not because his muscles are shaped a certain way. That's the easy part. Fighter knows he's tough because when he's been in those dog fights, he's been in those practices where every part of him screams that he should quit and he finds that extra inch, that extra moment where he can fight back. You know, he's been dramatically losing and overturned it. He's, he's put himself in those disadvantageous situations and come out ahead. So I think you know, that's something you got to do. You got to work on mastering the mind and you got to push yourself up against adversity wherever you can find it. What are some of the ways that you've personally uh, used to, to change your mindset or to, to own it? I think you have to get still, you know, for the first part. You have to learn how to quiet the noise because when you're in the mind, it's so loud, it's hard to even think. You know, you're weighing a million different paths, a million different options. So finding a way to still the mind, to hear that inner voice, which comes as a whisper, that inner wisdom that doesn't ever yell. It's always quiet. And for me, that's meditation, flotation tanks or sensory deprivation tanks. It's yoga. It's ecstatic dance. It's hyperoxygenation. It's like Wim Hof breathing. It's state change through hot and cold. It's uh, plant medicine journeys. I've used Literally, I have such a gnarly mind that's so hard to deal with. I've been forced to learn not only one way, but like 10 ways to deal with it and find my way through that. When you say you have a gnarly mind, what's what used to be your biggest demon or weakness as far as that goes? Like, can you give an con- tangible yeah, example? Yeah, sure. Just constantly obsessing over everything. I mean, my mind is so, is so obsessive and by nature and so wanting to analyze every little thing that I did. I mean, if I screwed up a handshake with one of my homies or like a business contact, you know, like you go in for the handshake and they go in for the dab and then like it gets awkward and <laughs> right, like right. that would haunt me for mm, three days. I, I have the same. With you. <laughs> yeah, no, like, uh, yeah, like three days, like w- that meant that amount of mental energy because someone went to dab and I went for the handshake and it yeah. got weird th- for three days. Like yeah. I can't, I can't afford that. Yeah, yeah. I cannot afford that. And that's one super trivial example. And whereas somebody else, is, they would be like, what? We missed the handshake? And I'd be like, yeah, remember that time two years ago we missed the handshake? Fuck. That's so funny. So when, when I came in to, to meet the first time with John, you know, mm-hmm. Wolf, I kind of had that a similar awkward goodbye. And I was just like, fuck it. I beat myself up on it for days. You know, there like you go. Super so, fucking insecure. So we're, like, we're, we're mind brothers. Yeah, yeah <laughs> Here we yeah. are. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, something that I learned from a buddy years ago that's really helped me in that is always assume positive regard Mm -hmm. uh, just by default. Because my default is to assume that it went wrong and it's the worst possible scenario is going to come out of that. And so he's like, no, man, just assume positive regard no matter what. And I was like, okay. And so every time that happened, I would start to just tell myself that. And I would. And 99% of the time, it totally worked out. If you look back at our life, has, has a relationship ever been fucked up because of a negative handshake? No. It's like the, all of the evidence points to, this is not a big deal, man. This is not a big deal. But the mind, when it's activated by fear, will play out all of those scenarios. And yeah, it's nice to be aware of how your actions could be perceived. But to, it's a choice. It's a binary choice between fear or faith. Like you're saying, assume positive regard. Like, man, just have a little faith. It's going to be all right. Right. Like no matter what, and then let it go. Like we understand the implications like, oh yeah, maybe that's awkward. Maybe they'll think we're a dork and then we don't, you know, blah, blah, blah. That's fine to think that once, you know, but not to obsess over it. From there, you got to fill the gaps of the unknown with faith because you know what? Faith is warranted. No matter what's happened, we've always learned from it. We've always gotten better from it. Yeah. No, it's a great example. Great example. So I'm really curious as to, 
what your daily routine has become, you know, going through these processes and learning these techniques and what you talk about in the book. Yeah. Well, that's the book, right? The book is the daily routine. So, Mm -hmm. you know, some of the key things that I think I've really anchored in is some of the first things that you do when you wake up and that's get a little bit of light, Mm -hmm. you know, because the circadian rhythm plays a much more significant role on our day than we realize. I mean, you used to sleep pretty much outside, maybe a cave, but the first thing you do in the morning is go out in the light and the photoreceptors that we have in our eyes, we have in our ears, we have in our skin. When that reaches the sun, that tells us to wake up. So getting that 10, 15 minutes of light, if there's no light, it's super cloudy, it's dark outside, I actually have some earbuds that emit light Mm. uh, called the human charger. I've I've used those on international flights. Yeah. Yeah. And so that makes a huge difference. Mm. Hydration, a little bit of sea salt, some lemon water, some water, right? When you start to rehydrate, you lose like over a pound of water a night, just Mm. breathing water vapor. So getting rehydrated before you jump into some coffee. Damn it, I thought I was waking up every morning, like having lost a pound or two of fat. I was like, oh. <laughs> nope, just water, just water. And then, uh, you know, from there, like a little bit of movement, you know, I have this trampoline right here about mm-hmm. eight feet from us when we're recording. And if I don't get it in the morning, cause I'm rushing in here and I'll hit the trampoline a little bit for my first meeting, I'll do some light yoga, kind of stretch out or I'll, you know, kind of get the blood moving, not a workout, but just all of those things really kind of set the circadian rhythm and tell the body like, Hey, I'm awake. It's time to start. Cause otherwise you can kind of zombie mode your way through the first half of the day until finally you wake up somewhere around 2 PM, you know? Well, let's talk about, uh, caffeine. Cause I thought, I thought your, your chapter on that was really interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I love caffeine. I so. love caffeine too. <laughs> yeah. So really the, the key thing is, is not utilizing that as a necessity to wake yourself up. Like this is something that you want to target and you want to use, you know, when necessary and use it intelligently. I think right now it's, it's that thing. Like you hear to people who smoke, smoke weed and they smoke to get normal. They it's call a dependency, it. right? It's a dependency, yeah. right? Like I smoke to get normal or, and you hear the same thing with coffee. Like you don't want to talk to me before I have my first pot of coffee. Like right. what? What are you talking about? Like, you don't want to talk to me. So at that point, you're using that as a crutch to even be normal, to even have discourse where you're not angry, frustrated, tired. That's a, that's a problem. It's not, the problem's not with the caffeine itself. The problem's actually not with marijuana itself or yeah, even talk about tobacco in here. The problem isn't with these plants. These plants can be incredibly helpful. There's a ton of science and a ton of research on the benefits of caffeine. It's about whether you're overusing them and abusing them to just be normal and just to live your life or whether you can intelligently do it. And that's what we talk about, blending them with fats, slowing down the amount of time Mm -hmm. that it takes to absorb it. So you get kind of a more time release effect using things like matcha, which has L-theanine in it, which is going to kind of temper some of the anxiousness of it and just using it intelligently when you need it rather than being dependent on it. Right. Right. Absolutely. Are you on, um, the intermittent fasting I am. Yeah. Yeah, I am. So we talk about that, you know, there was, I don't know, I think Kellogg's or someone came out with some saying breakfast is the most important meal of the day because they wanted to sell you more fucking cereal or something. But anyways, the science doesn't show that at all. Intermittent fasting is something that really does well with the human organism, does well with the human body. It's great for hormone levels. It's great for energy levels. It's great for mental clarity. And what that means is there's two ways to do it. One is to compress your feeding window. So to eat for only eight hours during a day and then fast for the rest of the 16 or take a full day or maybe two full days off during the week, but generally one full day off or two very calorie restricted days to give yourself a reset on a weekly basis. So we talk about both different ways. I, myself, I've done both. Mm -hmm. Uh, A lot of times I'll go straight through breakfast. I'll have lunch as my first meal and then I'll have a nice dinner because then, you know, dinner's the time to be social Mm -hmm. and it comes after my workout and it makes sense. But other times I'll just take a full day during the week and just not eat anything that day. And that I tend to feel best when I follow that practice, actually. It's the most significant impact. I'll come out of a full day of fasting and it'll feel like a real hard reset. Right. Yeah, I've, uh, I've become a huge fan. I usually uh, will just have, you know, kind of a, a butter MCT oil coffee for breakfast and then won't eat till 10, 11 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And then I have dinner by five. Yeah. And that's my daily deal. That's yeah, great. Yeah, it's been nice. So I think one of the biggest challenges people have when it comes to any kind of change is discipline, right? And that's kind of what this all comes down to mm-hmm. is does someone have this, the discipline to 
you know, even own a single day. So could you talk a little bit about the, your approach to self-discipline? Yeah, I think having, having it manageable, I think one of the problems with discipline is when it becomes this really big thing and it becomes all or nothing, you know, like if you're doing, you know, the whole 30, for example, which is a, it's a great program. It's a great idea to eat only whole foods for 30 days. Like, for, and anybody who's doing that, awesome. But nonetheless, it's tough. Yeah. It's tough. Yeah. And one of the tough things is, is the moment you eat something that's not, you feel like you got to start all over mm. again. And so the, the amount of discipline that's required to actually complete it and then feel the positive feedback of like, Hey, I did it. I actually did it. You know, there's only going to be a very small amount of people. So what I really wanted to do was focus on the process and allow for the flexibility. Like really it is an accumulation of choices that's going to change your life. So don't throw in the towel if you have a little too much to drink one night or if you had a bad meal or if you started this breakfast off, you know, shitty, don't say, all right, well, tomorrow I'll start. Well, no, you can start now. You know, you can choose a better next meal. You can choose to work out today. You can still do things right now that'll improve this day, which will then carry over to the next day. So first of all, don't have this all or nothing approach. You know, I think that's really important. And then again, focus on the process. I wanted this to be one day. I wanted people to get fired up and say, look, all I got to do is one day. That is a manageable piece. That's like Marcus Luttrell, lone survivor, when he's all shot up and threw himself off a bunch of cliffs and he had to crawl himself out, you know, thousands of meters out, out in the middle of nowhere and enemy territory. He didn't think, oh man, I got thousands of meters to go. I'm bleeding everywhere. All my bones are broken. I'll never make it. What he did is he took his hand and he drew a line in the dirt and he said, all I got to do is cross that line. And then when he crossed that line then he drew with his own hand and he made another line in the sand mm. and he crossed that line. And that's how the highest level performers get it done. They just say, all right, well, what's this very next thing that I need to do? And that's really what you need to focus on. Yeah. Bite-sized. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Let's uh, dive into the relationship side of stuff because you've built a phenomenal relationship with Whitney and uh, but it's quite unorthodox. You've talked about this in the mm -hmm. past on, on your podcast and other shows as well. But for those who haven't heard that yet, kind of bring them up to speed to your approach and your vision for your relationship because again, you've built exactly what you've wanted in your mind. You haven't followed any preconceived, you know, notions of, uh, you know, what most other people are used to. So, yeah, I think with anything, there's these kind of out of the box agreements that you certain that you have, you know, I think your, you know, your parents expect you to go to college and do these things and get the, get the job that's in that. And that's the, that's the current paradigm. And I think in relationship, there's a current marriage paradigm and that marriage paradigm is you get married, you become monogamous, you have kids and you raise the kids all on your own. And you do these things and everything else outside is kind of fringe or weird and has weird names and labels that you put on it that all carry generally negative connotations like poly or swinger or all of these things are like, Ooh, no, never want to do that. And I think that's a way to kind of reinforce the norm. You know, society does a lot to reinforce the norm, but then you look and you look at how that is performing. Like, how is that performing according to happiness how is that how is the divorce rate is it going up going down are people more satisfied or less satisfied when you just talk to your friends are they thrilled with this current situation you know in general what i found was that it wasn't and certainly for me the the normal download off legal zoom marriage contract relationship contract wasn't leading to happiness for both me or my partner and so I started to really understand love in a different way and understand what relationship could be like in a different way and realized that, you know, some modifications to that general contract were going to be what was necessary for me to thrive and for my partner to thrive. Yeah. And you just had the guts to acknowledge that and yeah. pursue it. <laughs> and, <laughs> and yeah, and that's yeah. hard ass work because you're, you're going against a ton of self-programming, cultural programming, emotional programming. And, you know, what we decided is that we were going to have a primary partnership, but an open sexual relationship so that neither one of us owned each other's sexuality. We would promise to be safe with, you know, be safe impeccably. And, but we would have the freedom to explore other relationships within the container of still living together and being primary partners. Can you share some of what that process looked like from a communication standpoint when you guys first started talking about it? Yeah. Chaos from when we first started <laughs> talking about it, because for one, you know, I understood it philosophically, but I'd never done it. She understood it philosophically, but she'd never done it. 
And we didn't have any friends who were doing it either. So, and we were monogamous for a few years and we split up because, you know, it just wasn't working out. We weren't satisfied on those levels. So when we tried it, you know, we kind of loosely agreed like, all right, we're going to give this a go so we can give our relationship a chance. But then when it came to actually putting it into practice, ooh, man, that was tough. And, and I actually had a, I had a lover first in that relationship. And so I got to watch Whitney go through the intense struggles of jealousies and insecurities and anger and all of these things. And, and I was trying to be patient, but I wasn't, I wasn't cause I didn't understand. I hadn't, you been, there my, I hadn't been there myself. Right, right. So I was like, come on, we agreed to this. What do you mean? <laughs> we agreed to this. Right. Yeah. And then, Oh, then the other shoe dropped and then it was her turn. And then she found another lover. And I spent two days like crawling around on the ground, ready to vomit every time I thought about her with somebody else. And I was like, Oh, this is what she was going through. And actually she was doing a pretty damn good job because what I'm feeling right now, I can't even take seven breaths without getting nauseous. Like, so then you start to have some compassion for how difficult it is. And you've just built on that. And we've gotten, you know, help from whoever we could and just try and support each other and try and understand that, you know, love, love and sex isn't in scarcity. You don't need to own it for it to flourish. You know, it's not like one piece of the pie where if you give somebody else some of that pie, you have less pie for the other person. And it's not the way it works. In a lot of, in a lot of ways, love is a virtuous cycle. The more you experience, the more you have to give. So obviously you guys made it through, through those emotions and, and that phase. Um, we did. I mean, there's still stuff that there's still stuff that'll come up, but the, clearly the pattern of chaos, pain, days of hurt, resentment, frustration is now so, so chill. And occasionally a little barb will stick, some new wrinkle will come up and it'll be like, ouch, that hurts. But we have the, the practice and the programming to be able to now realize that that's on us and not the other person. I think one of the pitfalls is you'll look at some specific way that the other person did it. Well, you should have texted me earlier. You texted me like you could have texted me at eight, you know, because you knew then and you texted me at eight forty, and and you'll focus on that because you're angry and you're hurt and you're trying to find a reason that the other person fucked it up. Cause it's not you, <laughs> it's their fault. Cause they didn't communicate right. And, and you start to learn like, Oh, I'm feeling this way. And it doesn't have anything to do with the specifics. Sure. Maybe the specifics could have been different, but really I'm feeling hurt. I got to address my own feelings of hurt. Where are my own feelings of insecurity? Where are my own feelings of jealousy? How can I work on myself before unloading a bunch of shit that isn't? So how do you, how do you do that? Let's just say you're going through that moment right now. Like, what the fuck do you do? <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to go back to, your, to the fundamental metaphysical understandings. You know, and that was, I first, and it's physical and metaphysical understandings. I first really understood physical human sexuality from Chris Ryan's book, Sex at Dawn. So that's the first place to start. You have to understand what the organism is in its natural state. And we have a lot of references like lions and stags. And we're not fucking lions and we're not fucking stags, nor are we silverback gorillas. We're a lot more closer in DNA to bonobos. And we're a lot more closer in DNA to the, all the ancestral peoples and how they used to live. And they had a radically different envisioning of sexuality. Even things like female copulatory vocalization, right? The reason why women, and this is postulated in Chris Ryan's book, Sex at Dawn, the, women, the reason why women are more vocal during sex is because that was going to alert other members of the tribe that she was having sex and ready for sex. And there would be multiple sexual partners at the same time and often in ancestral and you know, anthropological understandings of how humans lived. It was just a different way. It was all about the tribe, less about, the, this this union you know this monogamous union well monogamy certainly occurred and that was certainly also a part of it there's a lot of biological impulses that suggest that we were a lot more open sexually particularly amongst our tribe yeah i mean that's interesting if you're living in a in a group where abundance is the norm mm-hmm. right there's no need to have fear or jealousy when everything's there in plenty right? and it's all about us too because you know childbirth is you know, childbirth has a high percentage of death, you know, it's, and survival is challenging. Like the last thing you have to worry about is whether, you know, somebody is attracted to somebody else, (laughs) you know, like you're really looking to survive against the hardships of nature and pull together as a group. So it has this kind of group mentality. And you actually see this replicated in things like, you know, world war, I think it was world war one or world war two fighter pilots, 
where there was a really high death rate. And so these bomber pilots would, you know, pool together and everybody would sleep together. And the understanding was, look, not most of us aren't going to live, but all of us are going to pool together and the survivors are going to help everybody else out. They're going to help raise the kids. They're going to take care of the families. So they opened the container amongst themselves, created this kind of tribal construct just because the outer pressures of death were so high that it made sense. And so they abandoned these ideas of jealousy and abandoned these ideas of, you know, monogamous sexual agreements. So where do you guys stand today? Because I, are y'all going to pursue the whole marriage deal? You know, it's interesting. I think we, we reached as close, you know, we, we reached close to a level of mastery at emotional processing for, you know, on that open relationship front. Now that isn't the, the panacea that cures all relationship questions. And certainly it isn't for everybody. And I don't want to come out as like, this I've found, rabid I've profona, found this, I found right, the thing. Right, like this right, has right. been hell. The for, solution. Yeah. This has been hell for three years, but it's given us something to really work on. Mm-hmm. And I think now that you know, as this, as we've kind of conquered this problem together, now we have to you know take an honest look at the relationship and see like, all right, we've conquered this thing together. This was amazing. Now, what are the foundations for continued union? You know, what other things? Now that we're not working on this immense problem, this immense challenge, you know, what are the other fundamentals of the relationship and how do we want to move forward? Mm -hmm. And those are questions that we'll be taking kind of an open eyed, uh, fresh look at. Yeah. Need a new, a new goal or vision, right? Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Cause we have been, you know, very focused on, can we just survive this? Can we prove the model that this can work? And man, it's been painful, but it's been beautiful. It's so funny. Myself included and a lot of my friends that I've watched get married the relationship changes the very next day. Yeah. This, this, this goal and this vision and the two of you have had to get to that point has now been crossed. And you're like, now what? Yeah. Right? So that's been really interesting. So let's change gears a little bit here and, and use some of the time that we have left today to talk to the audience from a business work perspective, right? You, how much have you guys grown, if you don't mind sharing, just over the you know, last couple of years? Yeah, we've been steady between, you know, 20 to 40 percent a year Mm -hmm. um you know we had a big big jump right off the gate but then you know steadily growing that kind of last year was you know closer to 40 a couple years past been closer to 20 but somewhere in that range every year and how big is the team now if you can count all the yoga the yoga franchises that we have black swan yoga here Mm -hmm. in austin you count the gym and you count all of our entities then we have about 181 people so how have you handled the stress that comes along with that? You know, yeah, not that, a- not that well. <laughs> <laughs> not that well. Oh, man, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a beast. It really is a beast. You know, um, I've hired a lot of really good people to help me out in that. I've hired some people who I wish I didn't hire. I've made some mistakes. I've made some good things. But, you know, I think probably the the biggest thing is we've created an ethos that's the backbone. We've created something that this company stands for, a way of operating, a way of dealing with other human beings, a way of a way of being and a way of expressing ourselves that is the higher authority. And it's an authority that's higher than even me. And if you instill that strong enough, because I think one of the hardest things for CEO is to have natural checks and balances. You have to place an authority above yourself, and that's going to be hard with other people. Hopefully you have people that you encourage them enough to challenge your position. And so I really try to do that. If someone comes up with a contrary point, like, thank you for that. I may totally disagree with you and I'm going to try and convince you of my point, but I appreciate that feedback. So you have to reward that, but you also have to create something that you're beholden to. And to, to us, that's the movement. And so the, really the, the on it movement has really led the way. And I'm just trying to abide by that movement that's the guide star i'm just trying to steer the ship towards that i mean what did that process look like for you i'm just trying to picture it right if those who are listening were like oh that sounds great how do i do that is this something like a set of values or a vision that you sat down and put on a piece of paper and then got up the next day at the meeting and said hey well it comes down to the very core reciprocity Mm -hmm. so we have to understand that every transaction that we make we have to be giving as much or more than what we're receiving so that's the fundamental thing. And it's the same with every employee. Every employee who comes in, we have to be giving as much or more than we're receiving. And that's not always money. You know, that can be 
in support, personal support, opportunities to be a part of the gym and go floating and be a part of, you know, all of the ancillary benefits for our customers. That means not only the quality of the products that we sell, but the service that we provide, the attention, if they, if they have a problem or anything that comes up, we deal with that in a way that's very, you know, reciprocal conscious so that we're always giving and not taking. It even goes down to policies like our money back guarantee policy. Like people don't have to send back the product because that's in itself a little bit of a game. Nobody sends shit back, you know, yeah. just like, oh, screw it. It's not worth it. It's 20 bucks, whatever. I'll just never buy from them again. But if we make, we made it so easy, they just call us up and as long as they didn't buy in bulk, they can just, they can just <laughs> call up and be like, yo, I didn't like that. You know, I tried that, you know, alpha brain 30 count and I didn't like it. And we're just like, okay, cool. Here's your money back, you know? And yeah, sure. Some people have gamed the system and really secretly enjoyed alpha brain and then got the money back for it too. But you allow that slippage because for every one time you're taking advantage of that. There's 10 people who'd be like, yeah. damn, that was super easy to cancel something. Maybe I don't like that product, but I'm going to give them a try again because what do I got to lose? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's something we started doing about two years ago, actually. I don't, I don't did I ever tell you what we started you did. doing? You did. Yeah, challenge? that was yeah. a dope program. Yeah. You know, someone who takes one of our big uh, classes or courses or master classes, if you finish it and use what you learned at any point over the year and, and send us essentially what you built, we give you 100% of your money back. Just because that's what you're after, right? You're after a result and we're after you getting a result, which is the business we're in. And so that's been really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. So what's the vision here from your, your next chapter of your personal evolution and development? Like what are you, from an own the day perspective, what are you working on right now that you need to, to improve? In my own personal life, what do I need to, uh, what are my own edges? How what are, are my own challenges? How are you applying this process to your life right now in, in ways that you need to? work on i think it's about really the discipline to do as much as i can you know like i know the days that i follow my chapter two protocol which is the wim hof breathing and the contrast shower and the ice bath those days are significantly better than the days that i don't but what is my percentage of doing that 35 40 percent you know i'm i'm not owning every day you know but i know I want to get that percentage higher. Eventually I want to get that 65, 70%. And eventually that will become, you know, just ingrained and I'm making the time every day to do that. And that's, that's for me what it is. I, I really feel like this is the blueprint and now it's about the discipline, the timing, the, the ability to apply. You know, I have had days where I've completely owned the day and those days are fucking awesome. You know, but not every day, you know, it's going to be like that. And that's not, that's not real life, but getting closer to that hundred percent adoption rate where I'm doing certain practices that I know are helpful every single day. That's really what I'm striving for. Cause with light, with light and hydration, you know, I'm batting closer to 85% on mm. that, you know, so I'm really getting close to making that just a really, I'm doing this every single day. For 10 years now, whenever somebody's asked me, Hey, what's what do I need to do to be successful, right? And whatever context that is, usually in my world, it's business. And uh, I've always related it to building a house one brick at a time, right? It's like, I, this was not an overnight deal. Success is not an event. This is waking up and laying five bricks a day for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And the, the little bricks are the tasks that I put on my to-do list every night or every morning, right? And great, lay five bricks a day. After several years, you'll wake up, you'll have a house. And then you can build your next house or whatever the fuck you want to build it. And that's exactly what this is. You just turned it into an executable process for mm -hmm. every aspect, you know, of a person's life from business to relationships to health. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, that's it, you know, owning the day, wake up and, uh, lay your bricks and over a month, great. Then you get the result instead of, uh, having to try to take on the responsibility of, you know, changing your life overnight you yeah. know, for the next month. Right. So, and just to give people a heads up, you know, we dove pretty deep into open relationships and I don't cover that in this particular book. So mm -hmm. I don't want people to jump in here expecting that we do cover relationship. We cover sex, we cover some different things, but that idea of open relationship, I'm probably going to, that's probably going to be my third book you know, cause I'm still, I'm still <laughs> seeing, learning seeing how it ends. I'm still <laughs> learning the lessons. I'm still in the fight. I don't, I'm not going to put that on paper yet, but it's, yeah. it's something that I'm living right now. And, uh, ultimately I think, you know, I want to propose that and, and, but that's, that's a book worthy. That's another 80,000 pages that we'll dive into the yeah, nuances yeah. of that. And, you know, I just like, I like the idea that you're just, again, taking the, the vision you have in your head and, and bringing it into reality in whatever shape or format 
you choose to do that. And that ability is, you know, really what this is all about, right? Mm-hmm. Totally. So, yeah, absolutely. Well, brother, this has been awesome. When can people go pick up a copy of the book? Or can they pre-order it right now? Yeah, I'd encourage people to check out ownthedaybook.com and that's the pre-order page. Check that out and get it from Amazon. And um, I just heard, actually got news today that it's available for pre-sale on Audible as well. Oh, I'll nice. be out recording that nice. next week in California. So you'll hear my voice on this book. And uh, Thank you for doing that, by the way. Yeah. I won't listen to the book. <laughs> of course. Yeah. You know, and, and I was, as I wrote this book and went through and, you know, I had help from a great editor and Niels Parker to help me, you know, kind of craft all of these ideas and narrative, but I'm a writer myself. Mm-hmm. And so as I was combing through, I had to make sure that I'm prepared to read every single line of this book. So that was why there was so many rewrites. And I went through so many times because I knew in my head from the start that I'm reading this book. And if I'm reading somebody else's words, I'm going to sound like a, you know, I'm going to feel like a fraud. And yeah. so this is, this is me through and through. And yeah. uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't even dare to, to let anybody else read it. Awesome, man. Well, thank you for taking the time and the effort to, to put this on paper. I know this was what, probably a year of your life. More than if that. More. Yeah, yeah. More than that. Yeah. Well, and we get to. And to, it probably if you measured the telomere years that this took <laughs> off my life, probably a couple more years. <laughs> Well, thank you, because now we get to we get to benefit from it for like twenty bucks, which yeah. is just ridiculous. So, <laughs> yeah, books are books are an amazing amazing uh, gift that we've figured out here in life. So, thank you so much for the time today and for joining us as always. Yeah, thanks for having me on, brother. Good Absolutely, thing. likewise. And um, guys, go pick up a copy of the book. Thank you so much as always for listening, and we'll see you next week. Take care.